Good morning, friends gathered here already, uh, those joining us online, and those who haven't yet entered the room, because I hear there's such a thing as P Ridge time. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to jump on into announcements, uh, and uh, those that maybe haven't gotten here yet, you know, it's all printed out for us. You know, it's so simple. We communicate in many different forms. We post things on online. We, uh, we use the bulletin, we put things in print, and we speak them. Hopefully, that one of those forms of communication will get the message across uh, to you and everyone else. So, um, I want to invite you, uh, you'll notice in our bulletin, we got a couple inserts today, we don't do that often, but we just have a lot coming. A couple of things that need to be brought to your attention soon because they've got a time, uh, a, a time constraint. The first thing you'll notice, our Christmas poinsettias. We just got the information this week uh, from our... Um, from our supplier, I guess, I guess the florist. Um, and here's information about if you want to purchase a Christmas poinsettia. Um, we, you've only got this Sunday and next Sunday because we have to put the order in after next Sunday, the 24th. So uh, you can fill this out and drop one in the, in the uh, offering plate if you like. Or you can leave it on the welcome table after church. Uh, but they will be, uh, oh, it doesn't say on here, but somewhere I have information about where they'll be delivered um, here it is. They will be, they'll be delivered uh, somewhere before the 18th of December. So as we get close to Christmas, you'll come in one Sunday and there'll be all these beautiful poinsettias here. And then after the Christmas Eve service, you can take, take one home with you. Uh, also, I want to invite you all to join us. We're going to be uh, in our Advent study that's going to begin um, in, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, you may have heard we have a new bishop, Bishop Deborah Wallace Paget, and it just so happens that a, a little while back she wrote a book, an Advent devotional study, and what a great opportunity to uh, prepare ourselves and, and, and study the Word during Advent and also get to know a little bit about our new uh, Episcopal leader. So uh, there's information here. Uh, we're going to start, uh, the study will take place every Monday, because there'll be four, and there'll be four Mondays before Christmas, so four Mondays of Advent. Um, and if you can make it at 12 o'clock, we're also going to have some homemade soup. So we're going we're gonna to have, uh, have some lunch together, and we're going to study together. And I want to encourage you, this book is really neat, because it has a weekly study that we can do together, but it also has daily readings. So it doubles as our Bible study and as your daily, as some daily Advent devotional readings. So I want to encourage you to join us. If Monday at lunch is not a good time for you, you'll notice on this little insert, I've given you a place to check um, if you want to try an alternative time. And if I get a few people that say, hey, I'd rather meet in the evening at 6 o'clock, well, we'll create a 6 o'clock gathering for you. Or if you say, I'd rather just do it by Zoom. Well, we're going to offer, we're going to offer an online thing too. Because we know not everybody has the same schedule. Right, friends? So, but I need some information from you. So if you'd like to join and, and, and Mondays at noon, it just does not work. Uh, let me know what does work. And I'm going to do everything I can to make something available to as many people as possible. Um, if you want to order a book on your own, you can order it from Amazon. If you want to order it through the church, just check here that you want us to order a book for you. And, um, and find a way to give us $18, and, and we'll get you a book. <laughs> I don't set the prices, unfortunately. The publisher does that. Um, there's other things in here to look at. We don't have time to get into all of them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the other side of the in insert later in the service. Um, also, just to remind a couple things on the calendar, uh, lead team is meeting this Excuse me, lead team is meeting this Tuesday night. This will be our meeting for both November and December, so there won't be any more meetings until the new year. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but we want you to show up. If you're on the lead team, we want you to show up Tuesday night so we can do some important ministry work together. Uh, and one more thing next Sunday. Friends, next Sunday. You know what happens next Sunday? Right. All of those things are happening next Sunday. We're going to eat. Well, first we're going to worship. It's Christ the King Sunday. I love Christ the King Sunday. You'll see I'll be all full of energy. Um, we're going to worship. We're going to eat after church, cover dish dinner. Uh, William is cooking turkeys for us and donating turkeys for us to eat. We're going to have a Thanksgiving-style dinner. So I encourage you, bring your favorite 
Thanksgiving side dish or dessert that you would make for your family and bring it to share with us. Um, and after, after we, f- we finish eating, we're going to decorate the church uh, for Advent and get ready to enjoy that season. And uh, then we're going to say, go and have a blessed Thanksgiving week with your family and enjoy. You don't have to come back Saturday to decorate because we're going to do it on Sunday. Isn't that great news? I am all about making things simple. That's not really true. My wife will tell you I'm good at complicating things, but I'm trying. I'm trying to learn. So this is one of those opportunities. Uh, Are there any questions? I've thrown a lot at you. All right. If you don't ask the questions, I can't answer them. Um, But information's in your bulletin. Pay attention. If you're not sure, you can ask me later. You can talk to... You can talk to some of our leading, you can talk to Jill, you can talk to some of the other folks, and, and we'll be glad to fill you in. So, now, whew, take a deep breath and exhale all those things I just threw at you. And let us, let us prepare our hearts and minds for this time of worship. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's something even more important I've almost neglected. Today is Mary's 101st birthday and since most of us will never get to celebrate something like that we got to celebrate this one friends this this is we're all, all going to celebrate with you go ahead hit it emily birthday to you give it a little more pep happy birthday to you happy birthday dear man Mary, happy birthday, congratulations, we love you, and we're a better church because you're here. All right. If you're able, will you please stand and join in the call to worship? Children of God, when wars and rumors of wars circle around all around, Jesus says, do not be alarmed. This is not the end. When earthquakes, hurricanes, fires, famines, and floods produce chaos and destruction, Jesus says, When misinformation and disinformation try to dismantle relationships of trust in our families, our churches, our cities, and nation, Jesus says, do not be alarmed. This is not the end. Children of God, whatever leaves you feeling unsteady, insecure, scared, and confused today, do not be alarmed. This is not the end. We come to worship God, who inscribes our ending, our beginning, and everything in between in love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 117. Won't you join in singing?
pray. Merciful God, you hear our cries and honor our tears. Stir in us such a passion during worship that we might vow to give you our best. For the glory of your name, amen. Hmm. There seems to be an alarm going off. Does anybody know where it is? Pause. I think it's up here on the floor somewhere. Do you hear it? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. <clears throat> All right. Richard's coming. Oh, well, then it's going to be fine. Thank you, folks. Sorry about that distraction. <laughs> I was a much bigger distraction than the phone, all right? But uh, uh, I, I got a little bit of that sort of squirrel mentality, so I had to, I had to, had to solve it. All right, friends. Well, on that note... Will you join me in affirming our faith together? We're going to use an affirmation we haven't used as often. This is the affirmation, uh, this is the uh, statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and written, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall. seated and I'll invite our children to come forward. play a little game together and your part is when I when I tell you you're gonna clap give me one loud clap let me hear it one more time all right now here's what you're gonna do I'm gonna hold my arms out just like this right okay and I'm gonna when you see my hands cross I want you to clap one time like that let's try it again ready all right all right almost let's try it again here we go ready and Right. Okay. All right. All right. We're, we're sort of getting it. We're going to get it. We're going to try it a few times. Now, um, all right, one more time. Ready? Let's get ready. This is, this is our last let's sort of try. All right. You don't have to go real wide. I think we're kind of running into each other. Let's scoot, let's scoot out, spread out. Since you guys like to do the wide clap, this way we don't hit each other in the face. Okay? I know what that's like. All right, ready? All right, let's go. Let's go. One, two, three. Ah, right, that's perfect. That was perfect. Now, let's see if you can time it when my hands cross. Ready? Ready? Here we go. One, here we go. Here, my hands are going to cross and clap. And clap. Okay, all right, all right. Well, this may be a disaster. <laughs> but we're going to try. All right, are you ready? Now, when I do this, when I, when I cross my hands, you clap. If you don't clap, you're going to be out. If you clap when I don't cross my hands, you're going to be out, okay? 
And we're going to try it several times, so don't worry. There's no prize. If you're out, you're not missing anything, okay? All right. Okay, ready? Here we go. Let's go. I'm going to start out slow. Ready? And? Uh, all right. Let's start again. Sammy missed his hands completely. We're going to start over because um, you tried. Ready? You ready? All right, here we go. We ready? Okay, good, good. Here we go. Well, don't, don't keep clapping. You clap when I didn't cross them, then you're going to be out. All right. Okay. No, you're not out yet. You're not out yet. All right. Let, okay, we're going to start one, We're gonna start over. Now you know what I'm doing. You know how I'm going to do it. Ready? All right. This is it. Ready, Sammy? All right. And it, here we go. And... Okay, I'm going a little faster. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Evie, you're out. You were clapping when I didn't cross. No, no, stay right here. Don't go anywhere because we're going to try again. All right, ready? Are you ready? Here we go. And... Oh, I didn't cross them, did I? You clapped. Okay. All right, Sammy, you might be the only one left. Ready? Oh, I tricked you, didn't I? All right, let's give it one more. All right, everyone's back in. We're going to try one more time. Ready? All right. Here we go. Crossing hands. Crossing hands. Crossing hands. A little faster. Crossing hands. Crossing hands. Crossing hands. No, not crossing hands. Oh, you're all out. Ha, ha, ha. All right. All right. Now, come sit down. Come sit down, Sammy. All right, Sammy, can you hear me? Come sit. Come sit. Well, no, we're all out. We're just, the game's over. We're going we're to gather right here together. Guess what? We're all out of the game, but we're all back in together as friends. How's that? All right, so we're all back together. Now, today we're going to read something from the Bible, from, of Jesus, and he's telling his disciples to be careful. He says, don't let people deceive you. Deceive is a fancy word for trick. You see, when we played that game, I tricked y'all by pretending like I was going to cross them, but I didn't cross them, right? And then sometimes I went really fast and then went really slow, and I was trying to trick you and trip you up and see if you'd clap when you weren't supposed to. Wasn't that mean? Well, Jesus said, Jesus was warning his disciples. He said, there's going to be a time coming when some crazy things are going to happen, and some people might try to trick you. They might try to trick you into following things that aren't true. They might trick you into following false teachers. And there might be some people who pretend like they're Jesus themselves, and they're going to try to trick you into following. And so he tells his disciples, you got to be real careful and be real alert so that nobody tricks you. Kind of like in the game, you got to be real alert to make sure I'm not, not tricking you, right? So it's real important when we see what Jesus says. It's real important that we read the Bible and so we know what God is really saying. It's real important that we come and we be at church with people who love us and who care for us. And they're going to make sure that nobody tricks us, right? Because they're going to help us know this. So Jesus reminds us to always be careful and to always listen to God's word and listen to the people that love us and are serving God because he wants us to know the truth and, and so that we won't ever be tricked into following somebody that isn't Jesus. Does that sound good? Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes, do what you do when you pray. God, help us to listen to you and help us not to be fooled by somebody who who doesn't speak the truth. Help us not be tricked by those who don't love us and want to trick us. May we always keep our eyes and our ears turned towards you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I never know if you guys are going to try to pray with me or not. So I'm sorry if I confused you a little bit. I didn't mean to confuse you that time. All right. Y'all ready? Um, let's see. Uh, Avenel, is it, whose turn is, is it Avenel's turn? I believe it's your turn to draw a stick. No, yes, you can. You coming next week? <sighs> What does it say? Let's see. What does it say? It says airplane. Airplane. We're going to airplane out of here today, folks. (laughs) 
Well, that, didn't, that, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. And he even told his disciples that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must, you must become like one of these children. And I think we've always struggled to know what that means. But I think one thing Jesus reminds us is it's okay to let kids be kids. Amen? And what a blessing to see their spirit and their joy. And I know with my own daughter, I, I, my prayer a lot of times is, Lord, help me not mess her up. Help me not stifle her joy and her creativity. And I'm so, I for one, I just want to express, I'm so grateful for the children we have in this church. And I'm grateful for you all too because it's important that we're patient with them and we understand sometimes they're going to be a little wild. I'll bet some of us wish we could be wild too. They are. <laughs> Sean knows what I'm talking about. All right, friends. As we enter to our time of prayer, um, I have a litany of prayer that we'll pray together, but I want to remind you, of course, to be uh, in prayer for those on our prayer list. Uh, some of, I'll add to that, some of you have probably learned by now, but um, uh, our brother Roger Cole, uh, on Thursday, he outran us to the Father's house. And so we, uh, we rejoice in his, uh, his shall we say, uh, entering into the church triumphant, uh, even while we mourn uh, our, our loss of him. So won't you uh, please keep Edna and, and their children and grandchildren in your prayer uh, this week. Uh, you, 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 may, uh, you may have also know, but if you didn't, uh, uh, funeral services will be conducted um, tomorrow uh, at 1 o'clock at Chapman Mortuary down on 3rd Avenue. That, uh, near, um, I believe that's near St. Mary's. Um, so, uh, and then there'll be a graveside uh, at Oak Lawn. <sighs> Sorry. But um, uh, I, I have heard some of your stories the last few days and um, uh, what Roger's friendship meant to all of you and meant to this church. And, and um, we're blessed that he was a part, that he was here. And uh, it's going to be a, we're going to miss him. Uh, may we pray. When the skies grow dark and buildings fall, then hear us. Have mercy on us, Lord. When deceivers come and the nations rise in anger, then hear us. Have mercy on us, Lord. When famines begin and when the earth shakes to bring the future to birth, then hear us. Have mercy on us, Lord. When we take our stand to witness to your truth, when our people are arrested and betrayed, then hear us. Have mercy on us, Lord. When the sun is darkened and the moon fails to give light, when the stars fall from the sky, then hear us. Have mercy on us, Lord. When you come in your great power and glory with your angels from heaven, then, Lord, gather us from the four winds, from the ends of the earth, to be with you forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as... God's children, may we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, friends, as I promised earlier um, to speak about the other, uh, the other uh, uh, um, insert uh, that's in your bulletin, I just want to call your attention to that. Um, uh, something we have decided to do as a, as a church for this Advent season uh, is to support the ministry of the Burlington United Methodist Children's Home, or more specifically, support the children that are a part of that ministry. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a wonderful ministry that our conference 
uh, supports that takes care of children in the foster care system. Um, and they, they do a variety of, of ministries for those students, including, including providing foster homes. Sometimes uh, some of them, we have some group homes for some of those children. Uh, Burlington also assists with adoption services. It's, it's a wonderful ministry to these children and to their families. Uh, and to many others, and we're grateful for it. And they have called, they have asked for help uh, as Christmas season approaches to help provide uh, a wonderful Christmas for the children in their care. And there's information in the bulletin. We want to, we are inviting you uh, to to join us in supporting the children of the Burlington United Methodist Children's Home. Already, the Methodist women uh, have have decided to support. You'll see in here that $150 can provide Christmas for one child. Our United Methodist Women met recently, and they decided that they want to help as well. They're going to, they're going to sponsor three children out of the, the funds that they have raised in their ministry efforts. And we invite the rest of you, if you would like to, if you'd like to sponsor one child, or if you would like to simply contribute to our larger church supporting that, you're invited to do so. Uh, and that can be done through offering envelopes. You can designate on that envelope. Uh, there's also cards out in the narthex. Uh, there's some in the pew pads, and there's some out uh, in the narthex on the table with uh, return envelopes, you're welcome to, to write a check and put it in there and send it yourself. Or you can put it in with the church offering and, and join the rest of us as we support. Um, what a wonderful... <sighs> having one of those days, y'all. Um, this is such a uh, wonderful and generous congregation. And some of you here already, some of you, even in this room have um, participated in adoption uh, and opening your home to folks who need it. And so we're so blessed to have an opportunity to share in that. Um, <sighs> Friends, I'm not sad today. I'm actually filled with, with joy, a lot of joy. Uh, joy at the congregation I get to serve and joy at, the, at, at what, what Jesus is doing in our midst. And we get to be a part of that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm sorry that I'm a little overwhelmed by that today. I'm not even sure why. It just... So, in that, in that spirit, <laughs> people of God, the Lord has given us so much. Let us praise the Lord through our gifts and uplift God's kingdom together as the ushers come forward. Thank you, O oh God, for all that you have done. You give us life. You give us hope. You give us your very self. Take our offerings and our very selves 
that your will may be done in our church, in our community, and throughout your wide and beautiful world. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Hmm. Friends, you may be seated. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Hebrews, uh, the 10th chapter, verses 11 through 25. Hear now the word of the Lord. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for a time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since then he has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these... There is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his feet, flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is God's word to us today. May the Spirit add understanding to the hearing of and, and the application of God's holy word. Amen. Friends, our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, 
the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the good news of Christ Jesus. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear, <clears throat> when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me tell you a story about a chicken. His name is Chicken Little. He lives a normal little in a normal little chicken house in a normal little town. Chicken Little is neither tall nor short. He is neither fat nor thin. He is neither smart nor stupid. He is a completely normal chicken. On one completely normal morning, Chicken Little is eating his breakfast in the kitchen. He likes toast with butter and, and coffee with cream. He is reading the internet when he sees a terrifying story with a terrifying headline. It says, the sky is falling. He is so scared he drops his toast into his coffee. Plop. The sky is falling. The sky is falling, shouts Chicken Little. I have to warn everyone. First, he emails the story to 1,000 of his closest friends. Then he runs down the road to, to warn everyone else. The first person he meets on the road is Gwen the Hen. She is coming from the supermarket. Good morning, Chicken Little, says Gwen the Hen. Where are you going and why are you so scared? The sky is falling. The sky is falling, says Chicken Little. Really? How do you know? asks Gwen. I saw it on the internet, says Chicken Little. Holy moly, it must be true, says Gwen. Let's go. So And so Chicken Little and Gwen the Hen run down the road towards the pond. When they reach the pond, they meet Chuck the Duck. He's having a bath. Hello, your toe, says Chuck the Duck. Where are you going? Why are you so scared? The sky is falling. The sky is falling, say Chicken Little and Gwen the Hen. Really? How do you know? asks Chuck. I saw it on the internet, says Chicken Little. Oh, no, it must be true. We need to go. So Chicken Little and Gwen the Hen and Chuck the Duck run down the road towards the farm. When they reach the farm, they meet Bruce the Goose. He is reading poetry to Percy the pig Pigeon. Hello, everyone, says Bruce the Goose. Where are you going and why are you so scared? The sky is falling, the sky is falling, everyone yells. Really? How do you know the sky is falling? asked Percy the Pigeon. We saw it on the internet, they all say. Goodness gracious, it must be true, says Bruce. There is no time to read poetry now. We must go. So Chicken Little and Gwen the Hen and Chuck the Duck and Bruce the Goose and Percy the Pigeon run down the road towards town. On the main street, they meet Fred the Fox. He's sitting at a cafe, writing on his laptop. Hello, everyone, says Fred the Fox. Where are you going and why are you so scared? The sky is falling, the sky is falling, everyone yells. Really? How do you know the sky is falling? We saw it on the internet, they all shout. Well, then it must be true, says the fox. But do not worry, friends, do not worry. I know a perfect place where you may hide. Follow me. So Fred the fox leads everyone through the village, down the road, across the field, and up a hill. At the top of the hill is a big, dark cave. Come in, come in, my friend. 
Jesus. There is enough room for everybody. The sky won't fall on us here. We are safe. So one by one, Chicken Little and all of his friends follow the fox into the cave. The next morning, Chicken Little and all of his friends seem to have disappeared. And the cave is empty. Where did they go? We do not know for sure. But I will tell you one thing, Fred the Fox is very happy today, and he has a big round belly. Silly animals, Fox says as he sits under a tree, gets out his laptop, and begins to write again. <laughs> I found that, I found that updated version of Chicken Little on thefablecottage.com. I couldn't resist but share it, especially as I read the gospel reading for this week from our Revised Common Lectionary, and as I've watched the internets over, <laughs> internets, the internet over the last couple of weeks, if you spend much time there yourself, you may notice that some online and some on TV and other places, uh, indeed seem to think the sky is falling, or maybe democracy is crumbling. Uh, or you may notice that there are others who think that the golden age is about to dawn upon us. So which is it? Is it the apocalypse, or is it the second coming? Or uh, should, should we prepare for Armageddon, or to enter the promised land? I'm certainly confused. Today we read this troubling and confusing passage from the Gospel of Mark, especially that part where Jesus begins to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Those words feel like they're taking on a little bit of a new meaning. Like I can hear Jesus again saying, all right, everybody, calm down. And be on your guard. A lot of things are going to happen. A lot of frightening and alarming things. And, and disruptive things. But that's not the end. And be careful. There will be many who offer solutions and offer answers and offer quick fixes or say that they are, are going to fix it for us. Don't be fooled by fake messiahs. But be discerning. Be on your guard. Do not be alarmed. But do not be deceived. And have hope. These are but the birth pangs. Birth pangs. Now, I myself haven't experienced birth pangs. I, I know some of you may have. I remember when my daughter was born, I saw it, some of it up close. And I'm told that it's incredibly painful. But what I remember is on the other end of birth pangs came something wonderful and new springing forth. So what is about to spring forth that Jesus wants us to be ready for? Last, uh, about a week ago, I, I think I told you all that I, I attended the Level Up conference, and uh, William and, and Barb were with us there. And honestly, I, I went because I knew William and Barb were going, and I thought, well, there must be something good happening, and, and I want to be sure that... Uh, uh, you know, three, three are better than one, right? We can bring that back to the... So I better go check it out, you know? And uh, I'm really glad I did. Because all the keynote speakers, um, there seemed to be a, a common theme. And it was this theme of disruption. And of, of discomfort and of confusion. And especially, uh, this has been true of all the church, but we in the Methodist church have certainly felt it. You know, uh, COVID was such a disruption to how we do church and how we worship and, and how we gather and... We still haven't really recovered from it. 
Most of our congregations aren't back to what they were before. We aren't doing the things we were doing before. The people, the same people aren't here. Some, some are missing from this space that used to be here four years ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago. And so we're feeling this disruption that, that happened that we haven't recovered from. And, and we, in our own beloved United Methodist Church, we've gone through this terrible disruption of disaffiliation and churches splitting off and leaving. And we're still in the midst of that. And we're still trying to figure out what, what, what are we called to be now? Who are we supposed to be now? And, and long before... COVID hit. We were already experiencing the shift in culture that seems to have been accelerated by COVID, where all the things that we were doing that worked as a church, that we, we, we knew how to minister to our communities in certain ways. We knew how to, to do the things we do, worship the way we do, and people came and people showed up and we, we had stuff happening, and now it doesn't seem like it's working. And the people are different. We don't quite know how to reach this culture and this community. And our churches look different. Everything has been shaken and we're, we're struggling to understand and adapt and figure out how to get back to what we once knew. I read uh, not long ago that there's, a, there's a, another phenomenon happening uh, in our culture that's really accelerated about the last uh, 10 years, uh, but especially in the last four, and it's called de-churching. Um, that, and uh, studies are showing that about 15% of Americans are de-churched. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're not Christian necessarily. Um, it does not mean that they've lost their faith or been kicked out of church. No, it, but it means that they used to attend a service of worship at least once a month. And now they attend less than once a year. And they are the de-churched. They're not the unchurched that have never been reached. They're the de-church. They were once churched, and now they aren't. And, and their number is huge. More than 40 million Americans have de-churched in the last 25 years. And we're seeing seats empty in churches across the country, in large part because of this exodus. Um, pastors Jim Davis and Michael Graham, they, they explored this trend in a book called The Great De-Churching. Who's Leaving why are they going and what will it take to bring them back? And they write, more people have left the church in the last 25 years than all the new people who became Christians from the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and Billy Graham crusades combined. And as we look around, we kind of go, hmm, yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. The trends impacted every congregation, hitting every age category, from evangelicals to Catholics to mainline Protestants. The median congregation in the United States now has 65 people at best, down from a median of 137 two decades ago. Things are really getting shaken up. The future seems a little uncertain. If this trend continues, how many of our churches will be open in five years, ten years? In our, our gospel reading, Jesus predicted that change would come to the religious institutions of his day. As they come out of the temple where I'm sure they had gathered for, for worship, there in Jerusalem, and it, this is during Jesus' last week of ministry, the disciples have no idea what's going to come at the end of the week. But one of them looks up and says, look, teacher, look at these large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, says, do you see, you see this great building? Not one stone will be left on another. All will be thrown down. And the disciples, they were right to say, what large stones, the foundation stones of the ancient temple, which are still visible today in the Western wall in Jerusalem are probably the largest building stones in the ancient world. The smallest of them are between two and five tons, but the largest stones in that foundation are estimated to weigh 570 tons. I can't imagine how they got that stone there. And the disciples are looking upon this, and they're just like me, they're marveling. 
What massive stones, what an impressive edifice has been constructed. Can you believe this temple, Jesus? Isn't this amazing? Look how beautiful this sanctuary is. Isn't this amazing, Lord? And he says to them, you see this impressive space? It's all coming down. Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. If you know your history of that part of the world, you might happen to know that in the year 70, um, the Romans attacked the city of Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. Many people were killed or enslaved, and the treasures of the temple were stolen. And indeed, as Jesus had predicted, not one stone was left on another. They leveled the temple. The symbol of the religious cult of Israel, the, the symbol of God's presence and, and, and power and, uh, and, 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 and leadership of the people, the center of their faith and worship, gone, was one of the greatest tragedies in Jewish history. And it caused Jewish and Christian residents of the city at the time to scatter. You might say that all these people were de-templed. Unlike today, their change in religious activity was forced upon them. It wasn't a choice that they made, as the de-church today may do. And after they walk on the Mount of Olives across from the temple, this small group of disciples that are with Jesus, they ask him privately, tell us, when, when will this be? And what are the signs that this is about to happen? And, he said, and Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. That must take place. But the end is still to come, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, yes, many violent and upsetting and, and destabilizing events are going to come, and their lives are going to be threatened. But Jesus ended on a hopeful note. He said, but this is just the beginning of the birth pangs. There's that image again, birth pangs. Jesus knew that the detempling was going to be painful. It was going to be incredibly disruptive. But there would also be hope for a new birth. In fact, the Jewish faith was completely reshaped by the destruction of the temple. It forced the Jewish people to shift from, uh, worship, uh, from worship in the temple to worship in synagogues led by local rabbis. And, and Christianity at the time also became more congregation focused because the followers of Jesus could no longer gather at the temple as, as they had during the time of the book of Acts, for example. In the earliest days of the church, um, Acts tells us that the first followers of Jesus spent much time together in the temple. They broke, uh, but also that they broke bread at home and they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. So without a temple, both Judaism and Christianity had to focus on worship and fellowship and, and serving God in congregations outside of Jerusalem. As painful and as destructive as, uh, uh, as painful as the destruction of Jerusalem was and all that it meant for them, it set the stage for both of their faiths to become global religions. And Jesus had told his disciples in the beginning of Acts chapter 8, he says, uh, uh, chapter 1 verse 8, he says, uh, you will receive power when the Spirit comes and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and into Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's this, sit, there's this sense, even in Jesus' words, of the gospel leaving Jerusalem and going out first to Judea and then further to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. It's, uh, you could imagine it like the, you, will, you will be my witnesses at Pea Ridge Church, and then on West Pea Ridge, and then into Huntington, and then out Wayne, and then to the ends of the earth. You see that, that progression, and, and we see in Acts and in other, other writings that many, a couple of decades later, the church is still sort of in Jerusalem, and they haven't gone out as Jesus told them they would. 
And so we wonder, so we can see very clearly how God used this destabilizing event to help nudge the church and the Jewish people to go out and take the message of God beyond their, their comfortable borders. There's hope in that. Something new was being birthed in the midst of something tragic and, and frightening and world-ending. So what's going on in the American church? I mean, no, no Roman army has attacked us, but, but still we're scattering. COVID, the COVID pandemic, it had a devastating effect. I mean, I, we're still talking about it. Um, and somehow it's key, it, it, kept, it, it kept people away from church buildings, in some cases for a year or more. And many Christians fell out of the habit of attending worship. Got easy and comfortable to simply watch at home. Some left because of church scandals. Some departed because they didn't feel like they really fit in. Their friends were not there or they didn't much feel the love inside the church. Some left because they thought the church was becoming too political. Some, some were hurt deeply by how some others in the church had treated them. Some, and some simply didn't or don't find church meaningful for them anymore. The reasons for de-churching certainly vary, but the losses are consistent and they're real. And yet, despite these departures, as many of the speakers at, uh, at uh, Level Up last week were trying to encourage us, despite these departures, despite these disruptions and all these things that have shaken us such that we don't know what to do anymore, there, are, there is reason for hope. That God may be disrupting us for something good. We see again and again in the scriptures where disruption leads to something new God wants to bring forth. The crucifixion was probably the most disruptive moment in all of scripture. It was certainly disrupting for the disciples. But it gave birth to the resurrection and to the new thing that God was doing. Today's de-churching may be part of of those birth pangs that will create the church of the future. According to the Washington Post, evangelicals are looking for friendship, while mainline Protestants and Catholics are looking for spiritual practices and outreach programs. That seems a little reductionist to me, but okay. Many of the dechurched are seeking stable and healthy congregations that find a way to avoid the polarization affecting churches and other institutions. But the bottom line is this. And what we need to remember, the church is not a building constructed on large stones that can be thrown down. Instead, it is a stable and healthy community of faith. Pastors Davis and Graham say that the the congregations need to work on what they call relationship wisdom. And a quiet, calm, and curious demeanor. That's something speakers kept saying to us last week. That it's time for the church to... Take a seat and listen. Listen to our neighbors. Listen to those who aren't here. What are they saying? What can we learn from them? He's right. It's not going to be easy. It makes us sit back and go, well, we like what we're doing. But maybe it's time for the church to listen to the needs of our neighbors around us. We've been so used to programs and and all the conferences I used to go to 10 or more years ago were all about how we as a church attract more people. What can we, what great programs and great new music and and great children's ministry can we offer? And the people, and we open the doors, people just come. And then one day we all woke up and realized, oh, we're not in that world anymore. People aren't attracted to church anymore. May it, it, it's time, uh, and in fact, many of those same ones that offered those great models years ago are recognizing and, and trying to teach us that it's time for the church to adapt a missional model. Much like those early disciples, they had to go out from the temple and take the gospel message out into the community. They had to go to places that they weren't comfortable, places they hadn't been before. They had to be disrupted in order to go out 
and bring take the gospel out where 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 Jesus wants it to go instead of waiting for for those to come in church leaders uh, Davis and Graham Wright need to be quick to listen and slow to speak the path toward new life is not easy they say but it is simple it's not easy but it is simple yes birth pangs are not easy as many of us understand in fact they are incredibly painful but the path to life is quite simple if the church is willing to listen to people to respect different points of view work on developing friendships offer spiritual practices and reach out in a radio interview uh, Graham offers a vision for ministry that could really help us in the future. He says that when we put the kingdom of Jesus first, the kingdom of Jesus first, that allows us to love our neighbor as ourselves. It allows us to love our enemies. And it allows us to live in the sacrificial way that Jesus did. In Jesus' kingdom, the last is first, the first is last. And this is the opposite of our American story. And so we have an opportunity to be radically countercultural and really care for people, particularly the least of these people who have people who have really fallen through the cracks and people who are suffering. I think he's right. The church that needs to be born today is one in which we really truly love our neighbors, even our enemies. People across the political aisle, people with radically different points of view, people with radically colored hair. I'm just kidding, Emily. Um, <laughs> it is a church that focuses on living in a sacrificial way, the way that Jesus did, with programs that reach out and serve a world in need. Such a church will be made up of a group of Christians who develop who develop friendships, who really care for people, particularly those who are suffering and in tremendous pain. This new church can be like the old church of the book of Acts, the one in which Christians broke bread in homes and praised God together, having the goodwill of all people. We, have, we are indeed in a, an extended period of disruption. The stones of our beloved temple are tumbling down. But as Dr. Mike Bowie said to us at Level Up last week, every disruption in our lives is just an incubator about to give birth to a brand new possibility. Every, I'm going to say that again. Every disruption in our lives is just an incubator about to give birth to a brand new possibility. Normal isn't coming back. But Jesus is. Hear that again. I saw it on a t-shirt. It was on a slide, but it was on a t-shirt. It was awesome. Normal isn't coming. But friends, it doesn't matter where truth comes from. When truth is true, it doesn't matter if it's on a t-shirt or in a good book. We recognize the truth when we hear it. Normal isn't coming back. Jesus is. What an opportunity for us in the church. As we think about the things that we wish we could do again, or we wish we're here, we wish these people were here, we wish we were doing the things we used to do, we used to see the full congregation, we used to see this, we used to have that, we're wanting normal to come back. And Jesus is saying it, it's, it's, not, it's not coming back. But something new is about to give birth, to take place, to dawn upon us if we are ready for it. Do not be alarmed, Jesus says. Don't let the news of the day get you off track or get you dismayed. And don't let it lead you astray. Instead, have hope. And not an empty hope that's really a naive optimism that just wants things, that just wants to wait till things get better. Instead, we're called to hold on to a profound hope. Some might call it a feral hope. A hope that will not be tamed. It is wild and unpredictable. It's a hope that tells us the pangs we suffer now are but birth pangs. And something special is about to rise up in and around us. You know, today, around the churches, we're, we're seeing new forms of church emerge. 
and honestly, some of them are kind of weird. And they, they and weird to me, and, and I, I mean, I, I kind of like new and exciting things. But some of them are weird and unusual, and it's not like we've seen before. Uh, some were, uh, it's what some people are calling fresh expressions, or as, as our annual conference likes to call it, new places, new people. You Stop me if you've heard that before. But we're seeing church happen in unusual places. It's happening in t- tattoo parlors. Church is happening on hiking trails and in salons and at ball fields and around the table at a local breakfast spot. Church is happening in people's living rooms. And it doesn't always look like Sunday morning worship in in the hallowed sanctuary. But worship is happening in unusual places, in shared experiences, through acts of service and mission with neighbors, and the gospel is going out. And people are coming to know Jesus. They're not doing it in the ways that, that, that we're used to, that we like, that, that we're comfortable with. And Jesus is saying, that's okay. Because it's about God's kingdom. And it's about drawing those in. And may, maybe it's time to just let ourselves be disrupted. And so, I call on us, all of us here today, to pray and Ask, ask the Spirit to help us have open hearts and open ears to the people in, in the community around us. What, what, what might we hear if we really listened? What are the people around us seeking? What are they needing? What are they longing for? And how can our church listen and respond with the love of Jesus? Because ultimately... That's what they're seeking after. They just maybe don't know it yet. But they're not seeking us to give Jesus the way we like to package it. Jesus wants us to offer Christ in the way that they can hear it, in the way that they need it. What what are we hearing around us? What kind of church do the people of this community need us to be? And how can we love our neighbors on the ridge and love them toward Christ? What kind of church does this community need us to be? And so I call on all of us to pray, to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance. What is God saying to us? Where is the Spirit calling us to go? Who is God calling us to love and to reach? What kind of church is God calling us to be? What new thing is Jesus birthing in our midst? if we just have the faith and the hope to see it. May we pray. Oh God, the messages of doom and gloom and apocalypse, they have a weird appeal to us. We we cry and bemoan that it feels like the sky is falling, but if we're honest, we kind of like to complain and to cry and bemoan. And we like to reminisce and romanticize what we used to have and what is past. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for being so easily alarmed. Forgive us for so easily losing hope. Forgive us for missing that the disruptions we're experiencing could be amazing opportunities to opportunities to, to proclaim your love and your grace and, and, and your truth in, in new and powerful ways that, that people who've never heard of you might come to know you and love you and that w- there might be opportunities for new relationships. And so God, help us clear all the clutter out of our hearts and our minds and all the things we're trying to hold on to and help us trust you as you bring forth something new because we want to be a part of it. So open our hearts to your leading. Open our ears to the voices of our neighbors. Open our eyes to see needs around us and 
and open our minds to imagine what you might do if we just get out of the way and let you work and fill us with the joy to follow you wherever you're going to call us to go. Because when we see these things happening, can, can we be the way you called those disciples to be and, and have hope and look up and know that something new and exciting is about to happen? Normal's not coming back and we rejoice, God, because we can't wait to see what you're going to do. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit we ask it. Amen and amen. Friends, our closing hymn is number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This? And um, I want to sing, uh, let's sing verses one, uh, 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. I'll leave you these words from the Hebrews passage we read this morning. Hold fast to hope, for God is faithful. Provoke one another to love and good deeds, and while you wait and watch for the coming of Christ's reign. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Timing, huh? 
You know, sometimes, sometimes we pick him, sometimes the Holy Spirit picks him. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, how are you? Good. Where, where, uh, oh, they're back there. I was like, where, where'd your folks go? <laughs> Thank you. Good. 